case of Congo, who could advise a doctor in the Congo not to flee if he got the chance? Because he's likely to end up with a violent death. So all those problems are there. And I don't think it's that people don't want to go home. They, I think they do want to go home. Um, but the world is not, it doesn't provide the same conditions of order. All right, I'll stop. Oh, no, you wanted UK. <laughs> I'm so um, sorry. Yes, that's uh, it's, it's a pretty large question. So can you have a, a small answer on a large question? Because you'll, you'll get more chances on this. But this was the white paper question. Uh, what's your white paper on uh, optimal migration policy? The Home Minister in the UK at the moment is embattled with a general election coming. He won't move, she won't move a finger. She can't. She's got no room to manoeuvre at all. So you're asking me, in an ideal world, what would I be saying? I would be trying to demonstrate to the British population its overwhelming dependence on foreign labour and what is going to be its growing dependence on foreign labour. There are key issues on how can the native-born be protected, but by and large, governments don't discuss that. They're not very interested. They're very interested in discussing immigrants, but they're not very interested when you say, but a large proportion of the native-born population work in those lousy jobs. They have terrible conditions, etc., etc. You know, were we speaking about equality, then we could begin to speak of these things in the same way as who belongs. You know, the existential question now. Most governments don't accept that the majority of native-born don't belong either. They don't feel they belong. Who belongs? The rich. Those who have lived there for the last thousand years and so on. So all of these things are tied up with domestic policy. You can't have an immigration policy without a domestic policy which treats equally. In the case of the UK, I would want them to begin to move towards a much more flexible system in which employers could recruit directly. There are schemes emerging, bureaucratic schemes, the new scheme in uh, Britain, the uh, Labour Scarcity Commission, which is assessing labour scarcity. Another one is being proposed in the United States. They are enormously unwieldy and bureaucratic and slow. This is the problem. If half a million people decide to come to Britain as tourists, there will be a massive expansion in the tourist industry. How can any government recruit the labour in time? By the time the government's got the labour there, the boom will be over. Similarly with construction, similarly with all the other sectors. So the unwieldiness of the bureaucratic machine makes it impossible to fit it to the labour market, which is what which is why I think we must move towards circulating labour, not immigration, but circulating labour. So if you are in Uganda and you want a job, you can have it for two, three years, whatever, you know, to come and work and earn and do whatever and then go home. You needn't go home if you don't. I mean, all sorts of schemes are in the air here, but the question of this obsession with they don't go home seems to me is quite mistaken. People do want to go home. The only reason they don't go home is because they know they can never get back again. You know, we have countless examples of this. The Greeks did not go home from Germany until Greece joined the European Union. And the Greeks thereby got the right to come and go. Similarly with Spain, etc., etc. Most people go home when they can. Thanks, Nigel. I think, uh, Hamoud, you got to um, the commentary of... Yes. Uh, I'm glad that we are getting to the first point of disagreement here on the compensation issue. Uh, I agree with you fully that uh, compensation should not be put in the hand of governments and be used as a measure of control by the origin government to control their workers and before the, the, the receiving country pays the government, then the worker can live out. I completely agree with that. But on the other hand, there is a question of resources. Resources have gone into from the country itself as a whole. If we believe in a collective system of uh, providing education, then there is a resource loss. And there, we can delink the two. And examples exist, for example, uh, example exist for this sort of compensation, not directly to do with the, uh, uh, when the uh, doctor leaves the country or whatever, but to do with the paying uh, compensation to the country of origin with regard to social security. U.S. has got a massive uh, is the, the, the agreement, uh, it's a, um, system of transferring social security payments of the Mexican workers who are legally in the U.S. to be paid to the uh, Mexican government because a lot of these Mexican workers will go back home after they retire. 
and therefore they would not be uh, drained on their country of origin. They're accumulating resources. So we can have this sort of uh, compensation systems which would delink control of the state over the individual, but at the same time would allow for some transfer of resources. Coming to, this, to the, the issue of discrimination uh, the, between uh, doctors from Uganda, which is a doctor, uh, has a shortage of doctors, and doctors in India, which has a surplus, quote unquote. Uh, here we come back to the circulatory issue that you referred to. First of all, this sort of discrimination, discriminatory recruitment policy will not work because a doctor in Uganda can come here even, even, you don't, even if you don't allow it through different means, number one. Number two is this that if you have a circulatory migration where you allow people to be able to come and go at will, freedom of movement of people, that is very important. Within, within the European Union, this has been the most important principle of mobility of labor. If you establish that, then you get over the problem of the joining Uganda from its valuable skilled resources. Because people can work here for six months, can then go back home for work for six months there. Already there are as examples of this circulatory movement of people, especially of skilled labor, where they have the right to enter the country without any problem. And in the US, if you have a green card, you can move in and out. And that gives a lot of flexibility to mobility of the skilled labor internationally. I, I wanted to go back to this question also of compensatory mechanisms and, and see, I, we can see there are more comments on that sort of an issue. And at the end, Nigel, you, we'll hear from you about your response to that. Um, I think the, uh, to my mind, the question is very much connected with the nature or the uh, validation, legitimization, or the legitimacy of, uh, of the state. You set up the state in really as a being state against the people. That's the kind of a characterization you had. But that's not necessarily the only perspective one can have. Uh, if one thinks of a, of, a, of a strong democracy, and I think Indian elections are soon to be over or whatever, and I think there are limits to the kinds of democracies you have everywhere, globally, here and there. But um, So I think one can't say that there are weaknesses in the democratic framework and therefore it is not really a state in terms of you know, having some kind of a responsiveness to the interests of the people. India is full of inequalities, and one form it takes, for example, is that higher education is very heavily subsidized and we overproduce people. <coughs> Lower levels of education are severely underfunded and governments don't bother with them. The cost of one higher quality doctor or researcher, uh, the top end, um, who then, if you were to compare, for instance, you can do different comparisons. You can do a cost comparison. How much does it cost to produce a really good doctor from the Indian system, a uh, young doctor, and from the US system or from Japan? And you're going to find that the Indian doctor probably costs you one tenth or one twentieth. So you actually pick them up from there without having to invest your own resources in the US in generating those, those doctors. <coughs> and so you're actually earning quasar rents. You're earning quasar rents to their skills, which have been generated at highly subsidized rates by this government. Now, this government is clearly a government of the elite because it's subsidizing that sort of a, a transfer. Now, could there be, if you are thinking here of universal mechanisms and policy issues, that's the framework in which it comes. Is there a democratic process, I ask a question, whether globally or internationally or within the country, which can regulate the fact that when you have these quasar ends, that you actually can challenge them, claw them back, and put them to correct some of those, those mechanisms of inequality which were there at the start. At the very least, you could say they should not be subsidizing